organizations, individuals who are really engaged in this area. In addition to the two events that we're doing today with ICAIF, the one we had this morning on data innovation and government, the one we're doing right now, uh, we have a number of partner events today. Um, all of these events are uh, available. You can read more about them on datainnovationday.org. Uh, we have a, a hackathon type event in Philadelphia. We have some stuff on the West Coast, and we have an online uh, webinar today as well. Uh, you can follow all of today's events using the hashtag Data Innovation on uh, Twitter, and um, you can also uh, submit questions uh, via Twitter if you'd like as well for today's panel. Uh, so what we're doing today is we're going to have, uh, for the next about hour and a half, uh, a panel discussion on uh, these types of issues about how data is being used in the economy and different industry sectors. At 1.30, we'll have a, um, a hard break, and as you see in, uh, around the room, we have a number of uh, companies and uh, a lab who are you know, actually out there doing really cool things with data right now. Um, they have very interesting applications of using data analytics, using data visualization tools. Uh, so they've come in today to actually do demos. So uh, they'll be around until 3 o'clock. You can go around and see uh, each of these demos if you like. Um, actually uh, you know, see them, uh, show what they can do with the data, uh, they, and they'll be around to answer any questions you have then. Uh, so today we have an excellent uh, set of panelists with expertise from many different industries, uh, which I think is reflective of the fact that data is just uh, permeated versus every sector of the economy. Uh, first, uh, starting uh, on my far right over here, uh, William Chernikoff is a manager at Toyota where he leads efforts in technology policy and communications. His work includes analyzing sustainability, climate change, and energy impacts of technology development and deployment. Uh, then we have Scott Newman. Uh, Scott is the acting director of OPower's regulatory policy and research team. Uh, OPower is uh, a company that allows you allows uh, utility customers to better understand and reduce their energy usage through data-driven insights. If you are a panel this morning, you heard uh, a conversation about uh, the, the Green Button Initiative and how all this data is now being opened up, and OPower is really uh, leading the use of that uh, in the private sector. Uh, then we have Nancy Stacy. Nancy is a vice president at IBM, where she focuses on making cities smarter. She has over 20 years of experience in the business and technology sector, and has worked on a number of projects that combine technology, uh, and data to improve the effectiveness of different services. Next, we have uh, Rich Campbell. Uh, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Uh, and I'll, I'll introduce him now. But, uh, luckily, he's there. Uh, is the federal chief technologist at, uh, with EMC, where he focuses on, on federal strategy. Now, prior to EMC, he spent 13 years at uh, Cisco in various systems engineering roles um, in supporting data center technologies. Specifically. And uh, then we have Justin uh, Langseth is the president and CEO of Zoom Data, a startup focused on real time visualization of big data on tablet based devices. And uh, Zoom Data is also here demoing today, so you can uh, hear more and you can see it in action. Uh, Justin has been involved in a number of other startups and has a really deep expertise in data analytics, uh, specifically uh, text mining, I believe, and um, business intelligence. Uh, and last, uh, we have Scott Gatos. Uh, immediately to my right, uh, Scott is a chief technologist at HP. He has extensive background as a technology executive and currently leads R&D efforts for the federal healthcare market segment. Um, so we'll, we'll really jump in um, with this. I heard at a conference this week someone make the remark that they thought the, the benefits of data were overstated. Um, and I, I just completely disagree with that. In fact, I think the converse is true. I think that uh, the benefits of data, especially the the magnitude and the diversity of the types of benefits that we see aren't fully appreciated, especially uh, here in Washington, and um, I think just generally by the public. Um, so as uh, we'll, we'll go down the line, I've asked you each to make some opening remarks. But in these remarks, if you can, I'd like you to really uh, maybe highlight one or two examples of where you think we're really seeing uh, data have a, a particular impact on a, a certain industry. So, uh, so before I go, can I pick on Richard? Uh, if this is an area where data would have helped, uh, just shocking amount of energy is wasted and, and congestion is caused by people trying to find parking. <laughs> and perhaps if you had the information as to where there was an open spot, uh, starting on. Uh, anyways, thank you uh, for being here. As was, uh, was alluded to, i um, manager in the Energy Environmental Research Group. And while I don't generate a lot of data, uh, Toyota and myself spend a lot of time 
using that data to try to inform a lot of the uh, analysis and issues uh, related to energy and climate and sustainability policy and figuring out how uh, technology can play a role. Um, I, I think people have probably uh, become aware over the last several years just how much analytics are on board a vehicle now. They are massive uh, uh, data collection uh, collection instruments which, which we've been using to try and reform and, and improve uh, the technology and um, and make things better. I think there's going to be a lot of discussion over who should have access to that data and, and how it can be used outside of the vehicle and, and I'll defer to some of my uh, colleagues on the panel for uh, some good discussion on that. But I will give a couple um, examples. One is a, is a larger one where, where we see the interface with government and I think people uh, we're very familiar with uh, what happened with the earthquake and, and tsunami in Japan. Um, and the massive amount of disruption that occurred to the transportation system. Uh, and then shortly after that happened, uh, government was working blind, so to speak. And they reached out to the automotive companies, not just Toyota, Honda, uh, Nissan, and, and the others as well, and uh, asked the companies to provide information on what roads were available and uh, where, where people were moving and what needed to happen. And the reason we were able to do this is because of the data and the ITS equipment that was on the vehicle. We were able to then provide this information back to the government uh, in a way that told them what roads were accessible, what roads were not. And it had a massive uh, impact on restoring uh, transportation and accessibility, particularly during the first uh, couple days of, uh, of the disaster recovery. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's an important example of we saw how it didn't happen that way, perhaps, uh, during some of the recent uh, superstorm effects. So there's clearly some opportunities here in the U.S. Uh, how that data can be used, not just for emergency or disaster management, but uh, in everyday efficiency, uh, providing the constant communication to allow uh, entities like Nancy to uh, make cities and, and mobility uh, smarter. But it all depends on the ability to collect that data um, in, in large quantities and then process it in meaningful ways. And, and that gets to my second example a little bit, um, where it's not just about the data, but it's about what we do with the data. And uh, just uh, this past week, uh, people are in the transportation field, they, they're probably aware that uh, TRB was here in, in DC. Um, and uh, I did what uh, most people do when, um, when they need a solution to something, you reach out to uh, people who are smarter than you. So I contacted some uh, PhD students at, at MIT that I've known and uh, asked them to help with some analysis on our fleet of uh, plug-in electric vehicles. We had 125 of them that have been running um, in a demo program out in California uh, with, a, with a pretty standard data logger collecting second-by-second -second data. So a fairly uh, robust amount on uh, how the vehicles were being used, and this included information on charging behavior. Uh, and there's a lot of commonly held perceptions and beliefs about how people charge and where investments uh, should be made in charging, what the federal government is supporting this investment and people making uh, decisions on, on their own. Um, but there really wasn't a lot of good analytics on that. And so what we did amongst the many things, and if people want to read the paper, I'm happy to point it to you, uh, came up with this interesting mixed logic model, uh, which I won't get into the complex math of it. Uh, but it really uh, provided a lot of interesting analysis over exactly when people charge and how they charge based on how long they might be parked and what was the time of day, uh, how much range they had, and, and a whole number of other factors. And, and why is this important? Because it's not cheap to build public infrastructure for these, and you want to be able to recover your investment. And so. The point here is that, that the data can help uh, provide a lot of information on where it makes sense, both from a private and public standpoint, to make these investments. And the efficiency of the, those investments is really what drives a lot of our, our interest in terms of, of energy and uh, climate policy. Uh, so with that, I, I hope that's some good food for thought uh, and, and starting off this panel. And I look forward to hearing from uh, everyone else. Thank you. Great. Thanks, William. And Scott, please go ahead. Sure, so that's a tough act to follow. Um, <clears throat> my name is Scott Newman. I lead the regulatory policy and research group over at OPower. And I thought I'd touch on four things as it relates to OPower to kick this off. Um, and so I think, I suspect many of you are not familiar with OPower. So what I want to touch on is sort of what inspired our company, um, what we in fact do, and the savings sort of we have told the data, and then some food for thought I think relevant to this group about what the path forward might look like, at least based on our experience. So. Um, 
Opower was in fact inspired by behavioral science, in particular the work of Professor Cialdini, and believe it or not, uh, that research involved door hangers. So essentially, he, he posed the question, how do we motivate individuals to save more energy? And, and the way he conducted his experiments is he enlisted a number of participants, uh, and uh, these were homeowners, and he uh, used four different types of door hangers. And every morning, he hang one of these different door hangers on each of their doors, and see what in fact spurred them to save more energy. Now these door hangers had one of four messages on them. One was, um, in addition to these, these door hangers having information on ways to save energy, like turning the lights down when you leave, there were four different messages. One was saving, saving energy will save you money. The second was you know, saving energy helps the environment. The third was saving energy makes you a good citizen of the world and you're doing sort of societal good. And the fourth and finally was basically, your neighbors are doing it, and you should be too. And I'll tell you, when I first picked up this report, my intuition was, well, it's got to be saving money. It's got to be one of these things. And I was flat out wrong. It turned out over the course of this experiment, the first three door hangers, so saving money, you know, delivering sort of good or helping the environment, had zero, zero impact on people saving energy. The one and only thing that caused them to significantly reduce their energy use was telling them their neighbors were doing it, and you should be too. Um, and I think there are an enormous number of implications for this group, and certainly for O-Power as a result of that. What it tells you, I think, is one, uh, information is not enough. I mean, big data is great, but what you have to do is take a step beyond that and think about how do you present information in a way that actually motivates people to take action. And so in the energy space that O-Power is involved in, there have been another other, uh, a number of other ventures, even by you know, big companies like Google and Microsoft, to make it more clear to you know, end users about how they use energy. And those, I think it's been fair to say, have been rather ineffective because they haven't sort of unlocked that last piece about how do you motivate individuals to actually act on information. Um, so a little bit about O-Power in that context. We were founded in 2007, and we started with this notion of the home energy report. And the idea was, on behalf of utilities, we'll send something uh, not in lieu of a bill, but in addition to a bill to customers, saying here's how much energy you've used, and here it is sort of depicted relative to you know, all the neighbors in your area, as well as to neighbors that are sort of more importantly have similar households. So trying to instead get away from esoteric terms like kilowatt and kilowatt hour that none of us really understand. I've worked at Opower for a while, I don't really understand those concepts. But I do know if I'm using a lot more energy than someone that has a similar footprint, there's probably an issue. And so that's what we started. Over time, we've expanded our offering. So now, among many other things, we, we couple sort of that, that nudge to say your neighbors are doing better if that's applicable to you, with sort of individualized targeted tips for how you can save. Uh, and this requires both, I'd say, a lot of data and a lot of careful analysis. So as examples of things we draw and we, we look at you know, a homeowner's use of electricity and gas in their home, but we also draw on things like weather patterns to establish a baseline of what's a realistic amount of energy to use. We look at things like you know, great government data sets around what are some of the more energy efficiency, energy efficient, excuse me, appliances out there? And if you were to swap out your current fridge for one that's more efficient, what might be the impact on your energy spend over the coming months and years? Um, and, and this has been, I think, uh, you know, very effective for us. But I think one of the things is, you know, this involves very much big data. So right now we're talking about drawing on, um, I think it's hundreds of billions of data points when we talk about getting this right for millions of households that we serve. And this is only going to get bigger. So with the advent of smart meters, you're seeing homeowners go from you know, 12 data points a year. On average, you get you know, one read a month. So smart meters that may enable reads every 15 minutes. And so you might as well multiply that hundreds of billions of data points, uh, or 100 billion data points, times 100, when you start thinking that for a given homeowner, you're going from 12 data points a year to something like 35,000 change. So there's a lot of data we can draw upon. But again, you have to offer in a way that that people can act upon and be motivated to act upon. Um, just two more thoughts. I think one is we've seen the, um, the enormous sort of, I think, uh, savings potential of this, and they've been independently verified. So one thing I just want to mention is, you know, the context at least of O-Power, you know, when we send these things out to, to homeowners, on average they're saving one and a half to three and a half percent of their, their energy usage over a given month or year. And, and that might not seem like much, but I think the important thing to keep in mind when you talk about big data and really disseminating this information broadly is that a little bit on the part of every sort of end customer, whatever sector that applies to, adds up to a lot. 
And so in our space, for instance, we've been around, you know, about five years. And, and we just recently sort of crossed the odometer in terms of uh, saving two terawatt hours of energy. And again, that doesn't mean much to me. So let me put that in a context that at least resonated with me. Well, that's the equivalent of sort of taking the, the New York subway system off the map for a year. You know, you're talking about 1.8 billion passengers, they're off the grid. Or taking off the London subway for a matter of you know, a year and a half, or $200 million in savings when we talk about uh, bills for customers of, of utilities. So uh, you know, obviously we're very proud of that. I think what's, the last thought I'll leave is just, when we talk about, um, you know, big data, I think, you know, our moderator did a terrific job about touching this, touching on this in the beginning. We've invariably had, I think, to date a robust discussion um, inside and outside of this group around the importance of, of safeguarding data and getting data protection right. And it's been something that's been important to OPAR from day one, trying to lead by having privacy principles and, and essentially um, incorporating privacy by design so that you're sort of leading on this rather than having to play catch up. And I think that's important. And I think the discussion around you know, data privacy is essential. But I think it's what we, what we lack so far and what we need is an equally robust discussion around the benefits of really big data and why it's so important. Um, and so I, I, you know, I, I, I underscore that particularly you know, when I think about the context of our energy space. Um, smart metering, there's often this sort of, I, I see often a knee-jerk reaction that it, that it scares individuals that there's too much data out there. And what I think we need to have is more of a conversation around how do we appropriately balance the need for data protection with the innovation that can result from so much more data being available. So if we think about smart metering as an example, if you get this right, there's a number of wins. So when we look in the energy space, utilities win by uh, you know, a better ability to sort of monitor their data usage, to spot you know, outages, and, and for PEPCO to get over there and, and repair your issue. Uh, long before they would have in the past because they know about it right away. It enables customers to have better insight into how they're using data to save, you know, to save energy by putting in the right appliance and thereby saving money. And allows companies like O-Power to iteratively refine our products and look for ways to deliver better insights. So I, I guess I can just conclude by saying that, you know, I'm thrilled that we're having this discussion. I think it's really important. And I think the key is to sort of focus on how do we continue to tell the story about why it's important to recognize the need to safeguard data, but to balance that against, you know, how can we unlock uh, the benefits for all white people, right? Uh, thank you, Scott. And Nancy, I know you have a lot of stories here. Because... <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll try to, to, to uh, cut it down to, to, to only a few. First of all, thank you for, uh, for having us and for having this, uh, this session today. Um, I was really excited to be at this session. And I say that because when I look at the opportunity I think that we as a country are sitting on in terms of being able to use our data to change the way in which we operate, um, I, I think we just have an incredible opportunity ahead of us. And what I'd like to do is spend a little bit of time um, kind of positioning the way we view uh, big data um, within IBM, but then sprinkled with a lot of examples in terms of smarter cities. And I'm responsible within North America for smarter cities uh, in IBM. Um, as I was driving here, I was reminded of, a, of the first time when, as a child, I went to New York City to see a, a ticker tape parade. And uh, what's really etched in my memory from that experience was as we were standing on the sidewalk and you know the parade was, was approaching us. I will never forget the experience of having all of these little slips of paper and ticker tape uh, snow down on us. And you know, as the kind of heroes were, were coming forward and the cars were coming forward, my focus was entirely on these little slips of paper. They all had numbers on them, letters on them. And the only thing I could think of was what a waste, you know, all of this information. Someone thought it was worthwhile enough to print this stuff, but they didn't bother to save it or use it. And today, if we could each just visualize and see all the data that we produce and that's around us, it wouldn't be a light snowfall of data uh, coming down on us. It would be an absolute avalanche surrounding us. And when we talk about big data, we talk about it being driven by, you know, these three Bs. We've all heard them, you know, the volume of data we're getting from uh, the 
Internet of People, the Internet of Things, all these devices that produce data, um, the very the variety of data that's out there in terms of an incredible amount of unstructured data, which until recently most of us didn't have very much uh, real access to. You couldn't read at all. You can't look at every uh, uh, every medical image that's uh, uh, that's being stored. And then the third is just the, the speed with which we can process it. We don't batch data anymore, we, we stream it. And when I step back now and look at this data that we have, um, what I see is an incredible, untapped, largely untapped natural resource. And, and I really use, I really mean it, I really am serious when I say natural resource, because I think this is something that yes, we can mine, um, uh, we can uh, drill into, and unlike any other natural resource, the value isn't, doesn't come from owning it, it comes from what we do with it. And unlike our other natural resources, we're not gonna deplete this. It just keeps growing and growing and growing. And what we're seeing is that those who are using this data um, are moving ahead and are, and are achieving a great deal of advantage. So this data is, is there for us to use to uh, make our <coughs> cities, our counties, our states, our country smarter. And, and when I say smarter, what I mean is safer, healthier, um, more productive, more sustainable places to live and to work. And you know, you wrap all of that together, and it means something very important in today's world because together it creates a, uh, a level of uh, economic competitiveness that's going to be very important to us moving, moving forward. Now, one of the things that has changed, we have all of this data, um, we really believe uh, in IBM that we're entering a new era of computing. And we call this the era of cognitive computing. And that there are three aspects that I think are, are critical to this um, that are going to give us all great advantage. Um, the first is we now have the um, tools to be able to unlock meaning from a whole lot of this unstructured data. And uh, how many people here watched the Watson computer uh, win on Jeopardy, or at least are aware of it? I, I imagine, oh yeah, you can see a lot of hands going up. And what was important about that wasn't that we you know, won, a, won a major game show. Um, uh, yeah, the tools that it took to win that, if you think of how you play Jeopardy and what it takes to win, you need to be able to understand the answers, which is, you know, you remember it's questions, not answers that you come up with. If the answers, often the categories have a lot of nuance to them, there's innuendo, sometimes there are anagrams that you're being used that have to be used to come up with, with the answers. It's not just a, a search of a, you know, a text keyword search for answers in, in a database. You have to understand language and context. And one of the key tools that helped us win Jeopardy was a very advanced natural language processing tool. And we're now applying that tool in areas like healthcare, where again, 80% of the data, it was, we've, as a country, we've invested incredibly in um, putting in place electronic medical records. But 80% you know, of that data is typically unstructured data. It's uh, a nurse's notes, doctor's notes, it's um, uh, x-ray reports, et cetera. And we're now using this natural language processing tool to access that data to do things like identify um, uh, risk factors for readmission so that doctors and staff, uh, medical professionals have a chance to intervene before someone is discharged, runs into problems, and has to come back again. Now the second key aspect of this cognitive computing era that we, that we believe we're, we're entering um, concerns just the speed of, with which we can process information and the kinds of advanced analytic tools we can apply. So we've moved from uh, you know, uh, just-in-time analyses to real-time analyses. We've moved from sense and respond to predict and prevent. I'll give another example with uh, the Memphis Police Department. Um, we've helped them analyze the data they have on crime so that they can identify hot spots where crime is likely to happen and deploy police accordingly. Now, in the first year, 
Um, serious crime went down by 30%, violent crime by 15%. And this links to the third attribute of this cognitive computing era that I think we're, we're entering. And that has to do with the, um, with the ability we have now for uh, uh, computers to learn. So, you know, in Memphis, it's not just that you kind of do a nice model once and then they apply it forever. Constantly there's information about crime coming in and they're connecting the dots to, to have new insights. Things like noticing that when it rains, there are more uh, break-ins of cars and more theft of cars. I guess people don't like to get wet, you know? Um, so, you know, you, you roll all this together and what we have are a whole set of new tools and approaches that we can use um, to put that data to work. And I'll just share, share two more examples. I'm trying to give you examples from, from a lot of, of different areas. In South Bend, Indiana, um, we've uh, worked with them around water. And you can put sensors in, in, your, in your water pipes and collect a lot of information of, of, about water. And what we've done is we've enabled them to predict potential um, hazardous wastewater overflow situations. And again, in the first year, they went from having an average of the previous year having 27 of these occur to only having one occur in the dry season. The same sensors are being used to um, help with uh, the way in which water is stored and, and distributed and, 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 and used. And they've been able to avoid 120 million in infrastructure expenses they were planning to invest because now they simply control and deploy their water better. They don't have to put in the new pipes. They don't have to you know, put in, put in that, that, that new infrastructure. And um, now that Richard's here, I could come to, 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 to another example, which has to do with traffic. <laughs> and it also relates to parking. <laughs> we all get this game. And so, you know, in, in, in the city of Stockholm, uh, we worked with them around this whole traffic problem and parking because there's a real link between parking and traffic. In some cities, we found that almost 30% of the cars driving around the streets are looking for parking spaces. So in Stockholm, what we did was we, we helped them by collecting information, analyzing this, using predictive analytics. They were able to reduce their traffic by 20%, emissions by 12%. So you bring this all together, we're talking about a world in which uh, parking spaces can let drivers know when they're free and empty. Um, where in a city, we can get down to the city block level around predicting flooding. And where police can arrive before the crime occurs. Um, you know, as I look out at you know, this, this very impressive uh, uh, crowd of, of people. Um, I hope that as you leave this, that you'll at some point in the day spend a little bit of time looking around you and thinking for a moment about the amount of data that you produce, that your office produces, that you have access to. And ask yourself, am I using this data effectively? How many issues or problems am I working on where actually having some information could really inform what we do, could lead to better decision making? Where accessing all of that information that's in unstructured data could really help us. Uh, you know, I'm from IBM. I believe in the value of information and of technology. And rather than having um, what I consider really valuable, important information uh, uh, wasted in a uh, raining down in, in terms of uh, confetti at, at a parade. What we're seeing is that a whole series of cities are now using that data uh, to become smarter and to become more effective. And they're the ones who, who, are, you know, who are moving ahead. So, we can, we can use this data, we can make this a, a, a smarter world. Um, it's really for us to put that data to work for the benefit of us all. And I hope we'll have more debates and discussion about this on, on the panel. Great, uh, thanks Nancy and, and Rich. Uh, 
you've been involved in this. Um, I mean, you've been seeing this firsthand given your work in data science. I mean, you see the explosion of growth. I, mean, I guess we use explosion of profit, but that's and that's great. <laughs> Profits are also great. <laughs> but I mean, you know, this this is actually you know you're on you're on the front lines of this in that sense. So you know, talk a little bit about um, you know what you're seeing in that area and, and some of the benefits that you see. Well, so it's interesting, right? So I, I primarily focus on, on the federal government, um, military and intelligence community, and we look at big data, you know, very much like Nancy said, and everybody's kind of echoed. The thing that we see that's most interesting is that we're starting to really drown in the mountains of data that we're all, you know, having to deal with on a daily basis. And, you know, it's funny, uh, you know, dealing with the military, dealing with the government, right, everybody from SEC to an intelligence unit trying to figure out what's going on in the battle space, I see the interesting trend kind of in reverse, right? So. I look at my kids and I look at the kind of information and how they use information today. And when I when I compare that to what's going on in the government space, it's kind of an interesting contrast, right? So what, what I'm seeing out there today is we're seeing the younger generations are more adept at being able to take these large mountains of data, use them and consume them in ways that we traditionally have, right? So they're really becoming this interesting facet to how we look at data and how we look at the trends behind it. And, and it's interesting, I look at, you know, when we talk big data, right, one of the things that we see in the marketing side of the house, right, and, and the sales organizations is everybody wants to grab into the, to the Twitter feeds, right, take the national Twitter feed, run it through some Hadoop, run it through some interesting, you know, scenarios, to see what the result's going to be, right, what's the buying trend today, you know, what stores are being used the most, and, you know, what's my traffic pattern, and, you know, who's doing all this, all this stuff, but then I look at what the kids are doing. Right? Kids will consume this on a daily basis by the feeds they get from their closest friends, right? from the things that they're interested in, and they compile this on a daily basis. And that's really where I see the trend going to. Right? When we start looking at that data, we're going to see more and more organizations looking at it, not just what are my historical trends, what are my predictive trends, what's going on today. They're really going to merge it all together and say, okay, based on this prediction, we know X is going to happen. We know Y is going to happen. And I think that's some great capability, but where I find this to be really interesting is how it's going to affect us in a day-to-day -day world, right? So the funny part, right? I get here 25 minutes ahead of time, think I'm in perfect condition, right, to get, to get here on time, and I can't find a parking spot anywhere. Didn't know how to get to Union Station because I actually live in Raleigh. Um, you know, finally asked the police officer, and all he did was point to me and say, hey, you can go to Union Station. It's, you know, it's like three blocks that way. And I'm like, great. Uh, okay. So ten minutes out, and I got a five-minute walk. This is not going to be good, right? But looking at how those trends are used and, and the way we use information today, it would have been very nice for me to pull up an app and say, okay, where's available parking based on this destination that I'm going to, right? So it's the bridging of the tools, and it's being able to leverage them in our daily lives, which I think is where you're going to see the biggest impact of data today, right? So, yes, I work for EMC. You know, most people look at us as a storage software company, right? But what we see is we're starting to leverage a lot of these tool sets, right? Smarter connected grids in, in cities. We're looking at how power is being consumed. We're looking at how people use automobiles and where their driving trends are. We're looking at all this information and we're trying to digest it down to where we can make it not just predictive and not just from an analytics perspective, but how can we consume it more consistently? And I think when you look at the overall economy, this could potentially be one of the biggest drivers that we'll ever see in the economy, right? We're going to go from traditional task-based workers and task-based functionality to we're going to be consuming this, this massive amount of data, and we're now going to be looking at it much more from a knowledge perspective. So it really increases our, our general knowledge across the board. And you know, EMC did a really interesting study where they did this whole you know, the face of big data, right? the human face of it. And it's kind of amazing when you really kind of dig into it and look and see all the different data sets that we all consume on a daily basis, right? Be it at work, in our personal lives, with our children, with our health care. All these things apply to us in a big way. And it's now, how do we put our hands around it to be able to use it more consistently, right? When I'm sitting down, you know, where do I want to work next? Where do I want my career to go? Well, how do I handle health care? Do the benefits match up? Am I going to be able to commute? And all these things come into play when we start looking at this data. So it really, it affects us in so many different ways, and it gives us the ability to leverage it in so many different ways today that 
to me, big data is going to change the way we do things, you know, pretty much consistently across the board, right? From a workforce, you know, from our personal lives, from our health care, to the way we commute in cities, you know, to the way we look at power and water and everything else. And when I look at some of the use cases, you know, the military is doing a really interesting job and in, in the intelligence committee is, you know, gathering this information and trying to figure out where's the next attack going to happen, you know, is X vehicle, how long has it been sitting there? Who's been coming and going from it, right? Mm -hmm. Is it a potential threat? Is it not a threat? Is it, you know, somebody delivering produce or is it somebody delivering, you know, weapons grade material, right? We want to be able to leverage all that. But I think the use case is going to become a little bit more interesting, right? Where we're going to look at all that data and we're going to be able to know more consistently what's going on, how it's going on, how does it affect us, and then from a company perspective, how does it affect business, right? Are we getting the right things at the right place at the right time? And one of the examples I'll give you is, you know, we, uh, I sat on a, um, on a commission on the, on the big data report to the government just recently. And one of the most interesting use cases is around, you know, logistics. And, and one that we looked at was, you know, was what the Air Force is doing and how they handle, you know, aircraft maintenance issues, right? And that's a challenge because we don't always typically have the parts, the right parts in the right place at the right time. But when you start looking at the data behind it, right, the, the predictive analysis and, you know, the, the trends in the data, is a part failing because of a particular temperature issue? Are we seeing more sand in it based on their geographic location? All these things start to apply so that now they can predict and forecast what they need, where they need it, and how they're going to consume it. So it also gives us the ability to add a couple other aspects to it. Not just from a logistics and parts perspective, but do I have the right people in the right place at the right time? So it's a much bigger impact on how we use and consume data. So, you know, from EMC's perspective, the way the way we look at it is, you know, let's look at our core business as storage, right? How do we consume it? How do we use it? And how do we make it more accessible to, to everyone? And that's where a lot of the tool sets and the back-end IT architectures are going to come to play in a big way. So, you know, when you, when you talk to everybody on this panel, I think you'll find something that, that's very consistent. It's, right? How do we use the data? How do we consume it? And then how do we make it manageable, right? So those are going to be some of the key trends that I think you're going to see over the next 18 to 24 months in the data space. Yeah, uh, so Justin, I mean, you know, contrasting with Rich, right? I mean, Rich, you're providing the, the infrastructure, basically, to, to run uh, all of this. Uh, Justin, you're kind of on the front lines of providing the analytics. Uh, so do you want to jump in and talk a little bit about what you're doing in this area and how you see analytics playing a role in creating some of these types of benefits? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Actually, a question for all of you. Um, how many of you have ever run a report, like in a reporting system, a financial system, a sales system? You run a report, see, saw data? Some of you have never run a report. <laughs> good number of you have run a report. Okay, that's that's good. Um, how many? Second question. How many of you have written a Hadoop MapReduce job? No. Nobody. Anybody in the room? One. Anybody else has ever written a Hadoop MapReduce job? No. One person is. I I have. So two people in this room have done that. So you, uh, congratulations, everybody. You've all been disenfranchised from your data. I mean, you know, you used to be able to run reports on your data and, and see it using Cognos, owned by IBM, or MicroStrategy, or some tool. Um, but this big data revolution has come, and uh, people are just throwing their data kind of raw into things like Hadoop and, and big data, NoSQL, whatever that means, right, repositories. And that means, what that really means for you guys is you can't run reports on it anymore, and you've been disenfranchised from your data. And you're sitting next to the Supreme Court and the, the Capitol, where people have fought battles for enfranchisement over the years, and we just, without even realizing it, have disenfranchised, you know, 99.5% uh, of this room from their data. And that's really the, the problem that we're, we're trying to solve. And right now, if you want to run a Hadoop MapReduce job, you have to go beg a data scientist, if you can find one, to like code that up and, and run it. And your organizations probably have like zero to one to two data scientists, and they have like a line out the door. And um, so this big data movement, it sounds really cool, it sounds really great, um, but A, it's really kind of kind of caused some problems for the great majority of people in this world and business people in this world, and that they just can't run any reports anymore on, on, on all the data. Um, and um, that's really what we're trying to, to figure out is how to fix that. 
And to, uh, to do that, we really look at, well, what, what does work these days for, for people? What interfaces are really, really cool and what devices are really, really cool? And what we started to do is we looked at something called Google Earth. How many of you have ever played with Google Earth? Everybody, okay. You don't want to report, but you do play with Google Earth. How many of you have like zoomed into your house on Google Earth? Like, look at your house okay. Yeah. Um, so when you opened up Google Earth the first time, like on, even on an iPad or whatever, right? You, it showed you the Earth. And you, as humans living on this planet, recognize that as your planet. You go, oh, that's, I get it, that's my planet. It didn't like say Earth with like an arrow pointing at it, right? It's like you knew instinctively that was your Earth. And you figured out like how you could move around and pitch zoom in it and get deeper and deeper. You zoom into your city, you zoom into your town, you zoom into your street, zoom into your house, like that's cool. Then you zoom into like the tree next to your house. And, and you just figured out like how to do that without any training, without any uh, Hadoop MapReduce job writing or anything. It just was intuitive and easy. And any of you have probably all done that. And so really kind of looking at that as obviously that's the interface of the future. Um, you know, you can give this iPad to a two-year-old and they can literally figure out how to use it. So our goal is to build an interface like Google Earth, but for data. So we really want to be able to have you open up an application on your touch device see something that represents your system. It's maybe it's not your planet, but it's your business, it's your agency, or it's your, your city, if you're a mayor of a city, for example. And then see at a high level what's going on in all the different parts. Maybe if you're a, looking at Walmart, it's like rolled up to the stock price of Walmart, the sales today, the inventory, where all the trucks are, at a high level. And then whatever you're interested in, pinch this zoom, pinch zoom deeper and deeper and deeper into different levels of data. Maybe zoom into a particular store, Look, once you're looking at the store, zoom into a particular cash register and actually see in real time as transactions are going through that cash register. Um, like in Google Earth, it's not real time. Like if you went outside your house and you chopped down the tree and you went back inside and looked at the iPad, like the tree's still there, right? Um, so, but with data, we can actually do this in real time now because all the data is starting out as a real time stream going somewhere. And in the old days, it kind of got kind of killed because it went into a database and kind of sat there and got stale and, and stuff. But now we have these real-time streams of data, and we actually have the technology possible to enable that real-time Google Earth for real-time data. And um, that's our challenge, is to make that really accessible, really easy, so that all of you who, without even knowing it, have been disenchanted from your data, will actually be able to grab this thing, and instead of looking at your planet, you'll be able to look at your business, your agency, and see data from the bottom to the top, all in real time. And uh, some industry examples of where we're doing this right now is uh, in the e-commerce industry. We have people and customers who have websites, and they have websites have people like you visiting them, especially on days like Black Friday or Cyber Monday. And what these people who are running these websites uh, have is a continuous stream of potential problems, like things could be out of stock, pages might stop working, um, coupon codes might not work, people are asking about free shipping, whatever it is. And they need to be able to monitor this really in real time so they can adjust things. They can fix things that are broken or they can remove a promotion code that's not working or they can you know, uh, call up and reorder some stock and solve an out of stock problem. And business, and, and I would say government too, is getting to be a much more real time situation. For all the competition is no longer good enough to run that report on last month's sales. What you really need to know is what's happening right now, what's happening right now that's different from what should be happening right now based on historical predictive analysis, et cetera and then really make that easy so the right person in the organization can either see that or even get an alert that that's happening, immediately zoom into the right thing to look at and fix the problem. And that's really what we're looking at and really trying to optimize that so everybody's re-enfranchised with their data and has the ability to see what's going on, know what's going on, it's not supposed to be going on, and react and fix that and collaborate around fixing that and go from there. So that's what we're doing with <coughs> Zoom data. And uh, we're over there in the corner afterwards if you want to see a, a demo of stuff. And I look forward to this great discussion. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Justin. And Scott, um, why don't you just jump in? I mean, you've heard now from, from the rest of the panel. Um, but I know you've been working in healthcare, especially. Um, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that or, or other areas where you've seen particularly interesting examples of their use. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Daniel. Um, so yeah, so it's always interesting going last, right? You, know, you, you wonder, oh, I hope somebody didn't use my example, or what if they did, what do I want to do with that? <laughs> But uh, in fact, Nancy uh, did touch on one of the things that I'd like to talk a little bit more about um, and, and pull the thread a little bit further. But it's interesting, you know, so my role at, at HP, I'm, I'm what we call a chief technologist, uh, and I live and breathe in, in the healthcare space. So, so I come from our office of the CTO, uh, and my whole job uh, is very cool. Uh, for, for, I think it's cool anyway. Um, but uh, so, so what I get to do is talk to clients in, in this federal health space, and people like Medicare, Medicaid, at the FDA, the Centers for Disease Control, 
uh, Department of Veterans Affairs, Military Health, what are their challenges? What's keeping them up at night? What are kind of the new cool technologies and kind of technology services do they need to really hit on some major, major challenges uh, that, they're, uh, that they're facing? And so one of the ways in which we do that, or the tip of the spear in how we do that at HP, is we, we invest in a particular laboratory, a research and development laboratory, wholly dedicated uh, to looking at these challenges in the federal healthcare space. It goes by the name of uh, the Advanced Federal Healthcare Innovation Lab. It's a government-oriented thing, so it's got to have an acronym, so it goes by AFHIL. Um, so, uh, so anyway, uh, I get to run this lab, and we work with uh, technologies at HP, but not just HP, all kinds of different partners who come together to take a look at uh, what are the challenges, opportunities, and actions that need to be out there to help our clients actually move forward. So what I thought I'd do is just take a look at some of the research that's come out of this lab and give you an example or two. And actually, Nancy brought up a really good one that, uh, that we've dug a lot deeper into, and it's this area of natural language processing. Um, there's an, an interesting conundrum that we face uh, from, from a, as, a, as a nation, really, when you look at healthcare and delivering healthcare and then keeping the populace healthy overall. So there's been a large influx of providers implementing electronic health records for two purposes, right? First purpose is, of course, it provides uh, better, better, ultimately better care uh, and better coordinated care for, for their particular patient population. They also get paid more if they do it, right? There's a, under the Affordable Care Act, they're going to get a lot of Medicare incentive payments. So it's incenting them to do this. So we see some of this stuff going on in the private sector. But remember, I live in this federal health care space. So when you look at the health, the, the, the direct providers of health care, in the federal health space, you look at people like the Department of Veterans Affairs and Military Health, and they've invested in electronic health records for over 20 years now. So while a lot of private healthcare providers are running into some of these first generation and second generation electronic health record issues, how do I even ingest this into my workflow within my healthcare practice? VA and, and DOD have solved a lot of that, but they are on to second, third, and fourth generation EHR challenges. So one of those major challenges that's out there is the challenge that Nancy pointed out that said, there's a lot of good structured data that's in here. Like the information about what medications I'm on, uh, what problems I've got, uh, not all my problems are necessarily in the electronic health record, but uh, you know, all my demographics, um, there's a lot of structured information in there that my doctors can use to help create uh, clinical decisions of, about my care. But at the end of the day, Every encounter you have with the doctor, right, whether it's an outpatient encounter, you just go to the doctor's office, or even, uh, in, you know, you have some uh, unfortunate inpatient stay, <laughs> the doctor's always got a note. Every single encounter they have with you, they're going to write a note. And that note is a big blob of text. And we've tried different ways to get them to not do that, right? Like, create a structured note. Uh, in fact, the military invested heavily in trying to do that. Frankly, the doctors hate that. They do not want, they want to write their note. So. But that note and all of its unstructured greatness isn't usable in any of that clinical decision support. So you have this great structured electronic health record and years and years of investment in it, and then you've got the doctor note. That's really got a lot of the information in it that you need, but you can't use it. So what we've done is we've started to turn some technologies towards that, very similar to, to what Nancy was talking about, and extracting meaning from that. But not just meaning for uh, what does it really say, but meaning to then help codify that note and create it in such clinical terminologies that it can be ingested into the clinical decision support tools. So for instance, uh, there are various clinical terminologies out there. One of them is called SNOMED. So SNOMED uh, CT has basically 300,000 some odd clinical concepts. Um, and what we've done is we've trained a lot of these tools to take a look at all of my doctor's unstructured clinical notes and what is that note really saying? What are all the clinical concepts that are really coming out uh, with, with this particular note that he or she has written down? Once we know that, we now have a bunch of actual structured metadata that's associated to this unstructured note. That structured metadata can now co-join with all of the structured information in the EHR, and now you have some really useful information. So digging down into those examples, it's not so much a big data problem as it is a data and information management problem because we have unstructured data that we're dealing with. Uh, another really interesting example uh, that's, that's come out of some research done in the lab is a challenge that uh, was posed to us by the FDA. Uh, so FDA is not a direct provider of healthcare, but they are a healthcare promoter, right? They're, they're in business to help us all uh, enjoy happier, healthy lives through, through better health promotion. 
Well, one of the fiduciary responsibilities of, of the FDA is, of course, to keep the food supply safe. Uh, if there's some problem with the food supply, execute a recall. Uh, get, it, get it out of the supply chain, make sure that we don't get any tainted, whatever it is. Um, one of the challenges, though, of doing recalls is that there are unintended economic consequences of doing a recall. For instance, a couple of years ago, uh, we had a peanut butter recall. In fact, we just had another one uh, very recently. But a few years ago, the peanut butter recall was estimated to have caused the peanut industry about a billion dollars. Uh, and then we come to find out that it's this particular part of the supply chain, it's these farms, they were delivered to these areas, and these are the people that got sick. Meanwhile, some peanut farmer in Idaho uh, has been decimated uh, for no reason. You know, he or she's farm had nothing to do with it. And so there's, there's a real conundrum here as to how do we how do we keep doing what we're supposed to do, which is keep the food supply healthy without destroying the economic drivers behind it? So one of the things that we're looking at doing is going back in history and looking at uh, social media streaming. And I think it was, you know, Richard brought this up as well. So when we go back and we take real events that have actually happened, like uh, this peanut butter recall that happened uh, a while back, before that recall happened, what were people talking about in their Twitter feeds, in their, in their uh, Facebook posts? Were they talking to their families about their friends? What were they eating? How were they feeling? Where were they? What were they doing? And can we, from that data, infer what recall action should be taken and where it should be geographically associated to so that we can come up with better decisions uh, before we make these big sweeping decisions uh, that destroy economic drivers uh, behind all of this? So keep the food supply. Uh, safe, but don't destroy the economy uh, by doing it. So these kinds of experiments are some of the research that's coming out of this lab. And, and at the end of the day, you know, the, the reason for, for doing all of this is we're looking for these challenges that really will change something, that really matter, right, to, to all of us. You know, many of us here are from uh, uh, public companies or private companies that, that will ultimately uh, someday perhaps be public, and these are uh, profit generating areas, but, but at HP, it's really important for us uh, to do something that really matters. So these kinds of, this kind of research and taking these technologies and technology <laughs> solutions and ingesting them into the kinds of challenges and opportunities and actions that our federal health agencies want to execute really helps us sleep at night. It really makes us feel good about what we want to do. So I'm very happy to hear, you know, kind of wrapping up the opening statements for this panel, uh, very, very similar sentiments across the work that everybody else is doing. And I think that's kind of why we're all here. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to Daniel and we can go to any kinds of questions Great. or what's next. Great. So what I want to do uh, right now, I want to actually throw it back to uh, the other Scott. Uh, because Scott, you have a, a background in economics. So I'm, I'm sure you kind of think about these issues a lot. One thing that's come up uh, repeatedly on the panel today so far um, is about how people are using uh, data to make decisions, right? And so there's this really important uh, question of how do you get uh, data to knowledge that's actionable and that people are incorporating into the decision process, whether it's eating healthier or using less energy. Um, so uh, I understand it was your uh, undergrad that was economics, uh, but still, uh, since that was on your uh, resume, I uh, direct question to you first. Um, and anyone else that wants to jump in, uh, you're welcome to. But you know, really getting to that question, how, how do we actually get to the point of you know, impact where people are changing behavior because of uh, knowledge? So uh, it forced me to roll back the clock a bit in terms of the economics degree. And, and frankly, I'm not sure that, you know, while there's obviously an economic bent to this ultimately in terms of trying to find something that's successful, I think in Opower's experience, part of what's What's important is, frankly, to do to experiment with different approaches. Um, I think that a lot of the panelists here have made a great point around increasingly we're going from a shortage of data to a, a, a deluge of data. And so making sense out of that complexity is important. But that's only the first step. And I think that's a, you know, O power can be a testament to that experiment, which is, you know, we could very quickly give you information, you know, as an example, all of you, you know, with your gas and electrical bills in terms of how much you're using. The reality is, you know, uh, take the typical utility customer. They, they engage with their utility six to nine minutes per year at most, on average. And what that tells you is, one, there's a, there's a lag in terms of getting that information. And it's just dot top of mind. You have to pick amongst many different things to, to spend your bandwidth on. This doesn't <coughs> rise to the top. And so what's important is to try different ways to convey information that is um, clear, makes the information you know, very easy to understand, 
and motivates them to act. And so if I use Opawa as an example, the two things, again, that we've discovered is one, uh, essentially a keeping up with the Joneses story it is one of, of many options to make a very powerful statement, at least in our space. And two is to not stop at just giving data, but as many of the panelists have touched on around this sort of like predictive theme, is to push people beyond the data to what are some obvious interventions you can take moving forward to have an impact. And the more you can make that very understandable and, and very much sort of at their fingertips, odds are it's going to work, but extend that's no excuse for not trying a couple different interventions and selectively over time, um, you know, trying to improve the product. Anyone else? Yeah, and Daniel, to Scott's point, you know, one of, one of the things that we see is, is a big trend is not just how you consume it, right? It's, you know, when, when you look at, you know, you, you take a Twitter feed, like I, I talked about the kids, right? They, they see what their friends are doing, they see what's, what's popular, what's hot. <coughs> But from an economic perspective, how do you leverage that, right? And how do you take that and turn it into a model that you can actually drive revenue or increase your economies of scale, right? So, like, you know, electrical power, you know, forever we see people on Twitter, right? Oh, it's summertime, my power bills up. But wouldn't the interesting piece of data to know there would be, what are they using for a thermostat? Do they actually have a smart thermostat where it can adjust temperatures throughout the day so that when they're not home, they can actually reduce their amount of, you know, power consumption? That's where I think we're going to get to really drive some of the economic benefits are going to be as we start to coalesce that data a little bit more, you're going to start to see that, that information kind of come to light. Here's a way I can reduce my overall power use. Here's a way I can reduce my water use. Do I have a leaking toilet? Right? If we see, you know, the, the water company sees a spike in your water consumption, they should be able to send you a notice and say, you know, over the last five years, you've used X amount of water per month, and we see a spike might want to call a plumber and see if there's a problem. That's a that's an economic driver, right? So that's kind of one of the ways I see that you can really start to leverage it from an economy to scale and an academic driver. Okay. And you know, Scott, you used an example of, of a real world experiment, okay, of putting yeah. the, the uh, uh, Right. door hangers on and, and, and I think we shouldn't overlook the opportunity we have with big data of um, real world experimentation that's that's entirely naturalistic I you don't actually have someone running out putting different door hangers on and collecting information you, you can actually look inside the data and look at some of the natural variation that presents itself almost like an experiment and you know one thing that we've done is uh, in, in the arena of healthcare, in looking at these different outcomes of patients who have diabetes. And there's a really wide range of outcomes. And one of the things we looked at was, is there a different outcome according to who their doctor is? And what we found wasn't, you know, it was surprising. It wasn't that, you know, one doctor is great and another one's terrible. What we found was that some doctors were better at controlling certain types of patients. And now you think of the power of, you know, using that information when a newly diagnosed diabetic comes in. Let's take them and assign them to the doctor who's most likely to be able to have a positive outcome with them. Uh, same thing uh, when we've been uh, looking uh, in the state of New York at, uh, 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 around tax fraud. Okay, so you know, all kinds of analytics you can do to try to identify, you know, who's likely to you know, fall into this category. But now we're looking at analytics around uh, the whole choice of interventions that someone, that, that the state has, and what is most productive with which type of taxpayers. Because a lot of these interventions are very costly. So, you know, you don't want to have the inter intervention cost more than the taxes that, that, that are owed. And again, it's that sense of experimentation around <coughs> behavioral outcomes that you can get just out of the data from mining the data itself. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll put this back on transportation a little bit. Let's go back to Pippin and Richard. Uh, you know, it, 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 gets, it comes down to how people value it. It's, it's maybe not <coughs> just based solely on, on direct monetary. I, I suspect what was more important, the, the dollar and fuel and, and wear and tear on the vehicle that you might have saved not driving around in traffic or the 20 minutes of time, right? I mean, how do you how do you value that? But most people, I think, would say time. Uh, businesses in the area, if, if we could reduce congestion, uh, what does it mean for throughput in terms of, of people that can walk through the door because they have more time on their hands? Uh, 
what, when I think about it is that we, we struggle with, with monetizing the, the energy savings from congestion mitigation uh, and, and improving traffic flow and speed level. And those are all wonderful. It's very hard to, from a policy standpoint, to, to monetize that or get policyholders to, to make investments necessary to, to realize this. But when it comes to time, that they appreciate, although that's a little harder uh, to monetize. So it, you have to figure out how it resonates uh, with people. And sometimes the, the real monetary value or what you're trying to target to the use of this data and, and the analytics that go about may be the secondary outcome, but you have to package it in, in, in a way that, that people maybe have more visceral uh, connection to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, uh, I was just thinking when you were talking about that. I mean, one thing for me I noticed in the cars is that you know they they change from you know just recording how fast you're going to how efficiently you're driving, and you know you have that kind of immediate feedback where it's just the information that you're giving to the driver changes behavior. Uh, Nancy, I wanted to go back to you. You started to kind of get into this a little bit, and I wanted to dig in some more. Um, you know, when we start talking about what city governments are doing, and you know some are obviously more successful than others. I, I guess there's a similar parallel. Some are changing behaviors. They're they're doing things differently. Not only in just that they're doing smarter cities, but they're actually uh, doing it better than others. They're re redefining the processes. They're rethinking regulations. Can you talk a little bit about that. Yeah, it, it's interesting. Um, I feel like we have that you know, McDonald's sign where you keep changing the number of hamburgers. So we've done around 2,400 Smarter Cities projects to date. And at about the 1,500 mark, we, we stepped back and we said, um, looking across these, what made a project more successful? You know, what, what were the attributes in, in, in cities where we saw you know, a great deal of success? And, and we identified several things. The, the first was cities where they took a um, systems uh, thinking, applied systems thinking. They weren't just looking in, in silos within their city, but were looking at the data across and how they, how they could, could integrate it. Um, the second, though, uh, is really a change, requires almost a change in orientation and culture. Uh, I think we've all, especially you know, those of us who've been around for a while, have grown up in an era where there really wasn't a whole lot of data and information that we could access and use. So you have decision makers who are used to making decisions kind of on gut and the seat of their pants. And we talk about having to move away from what we call a hippo decision making. A hippo standing for highest paid person's opinion, <laughs> which leads the decision <laughs> as, as, opposed to, as opposed to data. And where we've seen um, city mayors, city officials, who were really able to make that leap from you know, gut level opinions to actually using data to help them in the decision making, we saw much, much uh, greater uh, success. And then the third attribute that we saw that was critical um, was around collaboration. And you know, Richard's given a lot of examples. Young people coming up, they collaborate just naturally. They're always connected. They're always getting information in. But where we saw the greatest success was where we had leaders who understood how to use collaboration, how to bring in the local university, the medical system, you know, private employers into what they were doing within their city. And it, quite frankly, it doesn't come natural to, 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 to everyone. Well, one of the negative sides of data, right, is, is sometimes you're going to find things that you don't like, that you don't want to know, right? I mean, let's take something very controversial, right? I was listening to this on the radio when I came in. They are talking about gun control. Well, what, what really defines why we should do this? And what are the, what's the real data behind it? Well, here's the problem, right? When we look at the real data behind it, it's not a problem. As much as I hate to say that, it's reality, right? When we look at, you know, things, I mean, it's not just things like gun control, that's just one that was, you know, it's top of mind. But when we look at the real crux behind the data, sometimes it'll lead us down a path that we didn't anticipate or that us as human beings don't want to deal with that, right? Like gun control. When you look at things like, you know, what is really gun violence, right? How does that work? Look at, let's look at the data behind it. What has, you know, created more deaths in history and what has done this? There's some interesting data to be gathered there, and it might not point us in the right direction. So it's up to us as a society to really understand how we're using that data and what is the, what is the outcome that we're really trying to desire, right? And that's where the kids and the social media and things like that have a, have a very interesting play because a lot of the data that they consume on a daily basis can change their opinion on the fly. You know, 
know, I've seen it with my kids. I'm sure anybody else in here that's got kids has seen it. That they'll say, oh, well, you know, the new popular shoes are Nikes. Well, tomorrow it's Reeboks. And a lot of that rationale is because either somebody bought them or they saw a bunch of Twitter posts or they saw a bunch of Facebook posts. So that's changed their behavior. So that's really the interesting part when you start looking at connected cities is how do you start to manage that data? And what is the behavior behind that predictive data use? Right. You know, when you look at the, some of the how cities are, are changing, how cities are, are, are changing their operations, you, you have that actually all the way within entire federal government agencies as well, where they want to absolutely change their entire behavior. So you look at somebody like, like CMS and, and the challenge that they have in front of them uh, with at administering the Affordable Care Act, and what does that mean to uh, Medicare and Medicaid recipients? Well, Medicare, historically, we all know, they're big, they, they are a purchaser of care. They pay claims. You go to the doctor, I go to the doctor, uh, doctors submit claims, hospitals submit claims, Medicare pays them. And then they, they come in behind and then they look to see if there's any fraud uh, that was in there. So there's a lot of payer stuff that goes on in there. Mm -hmm. Medicare doesn't want to be a payer of healthcare anymore. They want to be with what they call an informed purchaser of healthcare. And what they mean by that is that's getting much more into the outcomes of this care. <coughs> it's not just paying all of the <coughs> make sure everything gets done, but what value are we getting from that? That is a complete sea change in how Medicare actually wants to run and operate. Now they have tons and tons of data, and it's coming in every single day, every single second, there are more and more claims. One of the challenges is that those claims are all over the place. There are you know, different systems for Part A, hospital claims, different systems for Part B, doctor's claims, Part D, uh, prescription drug claims, and they're spread out all over the place. Now what they have today, they roll that into you know staging areas and up and up and up and up and finally into big data warehouses in the sky that they can take a look at. But now all of that data is weeks and weeks old. Uh, it's not really getting into all of the federated data that's out there. And it's still just claims. It's not the actual outcome of what actually happened in those healthcare encounters with, with all of that. For that, they need to pull in information from all these electronic health records that are out there. In order to drastically change, the, you know, they're, they're not a city, right, but they're, they're a government agency who wants to do a 180 in how they actually deliver and purchase better healthcare uh, for all of us as citizens. These, these challenges that, that are out there for them, only sort of big data and information management solutions can help them. But it's not the big data and information uh, management solutions of yesterday <coughs> and things like data warehousing and, and that sort of stuff to, to Justin's point, just leave the data where it is. And this gets back to the idea of how do we change the behaviors? Well, sometimes it's not changing the behaviors. Let them be what they are. I mentioned that with the doctors. We try to get doctors to do structured notes. They don't want to do that. Stop trying to get them to do that. Let them do what they do and we'll figure out solutions. So it's the same thing with Medicare. There's all this data out there. Leave it where it is. We'll get to the data and ingest it into some of these big data solutions so that the data can remain federated and doesn't have to go through all the machinations up to uh, big data warehouses in the sky. So to get them to get these 180 degree shifts in, in how they operate today to where they want to operate tomorrow, it's only these kind of solutions that we're all talking about here that will help them get this. Scott, let me ask you a little bit more about that. Um, so, I mean, one of the, I think, interesting examples came out last week. Uh, United Healthcare uh, announced that they were partnering with uh, Mayo Clinic, that they were going to be merging their records so that they were going to take 20 years of uh, insurer payer history and combine that with all this, you know, live, uh, you know, electronic health records that they have in the hospital. So it seems like, I understand what you're saying, leave the data where it is, but you still, when you have decentralized data, there are barriers, whether they're organizational barriers or technical barriers. So how do we deal with this problem of, uh, you get really great benefits when you have access to data. That's why I think we're seeing so many great projects in our government, because they have population-wide data, whatever that population is. It might not be people, it might be you know, companies or restaurants. How do we do the same thing in the private sector, where you, you really want all the data to do something really interesting, where you have different players you have? Sure, so, so there's a lot of issues with that, right? And not, not, the, not the least of which is data use agreements, right? And whose data is it, right? That's the whole big healthcare conundrum, right? Is my medical record my medical record? Or is it United Healthcare's, or is it the Mayo Clinic's, or, or wherever? And that's a whole big you know, legal battle that, that's underway, uh, constantly uh, churning as well. But, one of, one of the biggest things that can help is new ways of thinking about that federated data and not having to pull that data, but rather just creating indexes 
uh, that sort of meta indexes that live atop all of this. So you get the data owners to agree that they're going to allow their data to be indexed, but not take it from them. It's going to stay with them where they are, and there will be indexes built on top of them. And from those indexes, we can start to infer a lot of the, the data analytics that, that, uh, that we require to, to make some of these changes. But you know, it's interesting that United Healthcare and that Mayo Clinic example is, is a private sector example of the exact same thing I just said with Medicare. Why does United Healthcare want to do that? United Healthcare is going to get uh, paid better if they understand the actual clinical outcomes uh, for not paid better, but you know they're going to save on their own payments uh, for healthcare if they understand the outcomes of all of this. So it behooves them to work with healthcare providers like like a Mayo Clinic, so they have economic incentive to do it. That's one. You've got that there, and then you've got some technological ways to not have to shove all that data around by meta indexes that can exist in the ether on top of all of these things. So you have a couple of things in economic drivers pushing them to do it, and then some technological solutions allowing them uh, new ways of, of getting access to that better data. We're seeing the exact same thing actually in terms of distributed nature of data, because I spent you know, years building data warehouses where we'd suck all the data into a central place, ETL, these processes, very expensive, very slow, millions of dollars, millions of, you know, many years. And what's happening now is by the time you spend a year and a million dollars ETLing data into a data warehouse, half of the data structures have changed. And so that, that whole process just gets thrown out the window. And we're seeing really it moves to more of kind of like a distributed processing of data. And kind of like Akamai's model for content, they kind of push content to the edge of the network so that when you pull down a, a news article, it loads really fast, whether no matter where you are in the world. We're pushing out kind of data analysis to the edge of wherever the data is. So we're not trying to transport the data to a central place. We're saying, fine, leave the data where it is, to your point. We'll process it locally there and then just stream whatever the right result sets are together in real time so that we can kind of fuse, analyze those, you know, at the last step on somebody's iPad, for example. So just, you know, this distributed analysis of data and this collaborative analysis of data really change the way that people need to approach pretty much everything from the data perspective at the end. Great. I want to open it up for questions. Um, we have a, a microphone in the back, uh, so you can just raise your hand and bring it up. Um, sure, right here. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, right, right. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, my name is Jenny Adams. I'm with the Department of Agriculture, and a lot of your stories really, really touched me. Everything from peanut butter <laughs> to uh, the, the door hangers um, to information being available. With your permission, I just want to make an announcement and then a really quick question. So um, one of the things to reflect on is that the Chicago Board of Trade, um, created in 1884, it's been around for 165 years, is one of the largest um, options, uh, organizations in the world, and has been producing agricultural data since 1884. So there's 165 years of data out there. The agricultural sector has um, one of the most advanced data availability. Um, and so I just want to put that out there for people to think about. And just a quick announcement. Um, at USDA, we're responsible for setting up um, a commitment that the G8 made at Camp David Summit this last year. And we are hosting an international conference on open data for agriculture. It's going to include the G8 nations um, from Africa and others, private sector, non-private sector. Um, and definitely looking for anyone who's interested in participating, just feel free to speak with me. It's going to be here in D.C. Uh, the week of April 8th. And what we're going to focus on is utilizing open data to advance solutions to solve food security issues. Um, and so we'll have a call for ideas. Companies will be able to apply to be part of the conference to present. So it brings me to my question just really quickly. Um, we have a, a great panel here, and one of the things that we're looking at as part of this conference is the challenge of working on open data in developing countries. You have technical divide, cultural divide, language issues, literacy issues. One of the things we've been told is that in a lot of African countries, women who hold most of the household's information on purchases of food and production of food for the household, uh, they are often third in line to get a mobile phone. So the first mobile phone goes to the dad, the second mobile phone goes to the son, and then she who holds most of the information may not get a mobile phone until the third or passed down used one is available. And mobile phones are huge in Africa for, for communications purposes. So looking at your various industries, are there some best practices you can share for breaking through some of those barriers in developing countries? Thank you. That's an interesting question. So one of the things that I struggle with on a, on a daily basis is you know, in dealing with the government and 
dealing with the military intelligence community is one of the things that we <coughs> lack today is a standard around how we put this data together, right? So um, a couple of the different agencies have created metadata standards working groups. So that's one of the areas that I think you're going to find over the next probably 18 to 24 months that is going to be a very big determining factor in how we look at data once we actually tag it correctly. So the metadata tagging portion of it is going to be probably first and foremost to how we look at the data and how we can you know, gather the data more consistently. But more importantly, it's, it gives us a standard so that we know the what, why, when, where, and how, right? That's really the key behind the metadata. I don't really need to know what it was they bought, how they bought it, I mean, I do. But what's more important is, if I want to look at geographies, right? So like if, I, if I'm an ag guy, I want to look at a specific region, how do I ensure that I'm getting the right data from that region? Part of that metadata is really what's going to get us that, right? Because it, it could be you know, GPS-based, you know, name a location-based service, you know, and then it can be tagged with, you know, is it a particular industry, right? Even if we can get to the smallest form of metadata tagging some of this data as a standard, I think you'd see that speed to access even more consistently. But more importantly, it'll help us in a lot of areas that we, we haven't been able to address in the past because of technological challenges. You know, th this doesn't answer your, your um, issue around cell phones, and it's from a slightly different area, but I hope you'll see the, uh, the relevance. Um, one of the things that we do is we do something we call Extreme Blue Projects. And these are special projects that are a summer project with uh, MBA uh, graduate students in, in, in specific scientific areas. And they typically are done to tackle some tough problem. And I'll always involve a, uh, a client as, as a partner. And uh, we did one with Novartis that was specifically around <coughs> Uh, they have a vaccine that's effective for malaria. And, but the challenge is a supply chain challenge in Africa of getting, it's only, effect, it's most effective if it's taken within, I think I can't remember the exact time frame, but think you know, two, two days or something of, of symptoms occurring. And so um, and we, we had a group, uh, part of the, the team involved some African graduate students. And this whole issue of how they could use cell phones came up. And in the end, um, what was built was a whole approach that involved having just a single community cell phone for a clinic um, that would report information both on how much vaccine they have and on the incident of, incidence of, uh, of malarial symptoms. And it was a very simple app, but all the data collection came through uh, uh, you know, these highly distributed uh, cell phones. But in many areas, they had to use, my understanding was they had to use kind of a community cell phone that multiple people, multiple little clinics would, would report into then enter, enter their data. And it became this incredibly cost-effective system for getting the vaccine to where it was needed um, quickly without building any new infrastructure, without you know, very, very little investment. And so I just use it as an example of how we might be able to stretch our thinking in the area of agriculture around how having you know, a single designated community, <laughs> community phone that has the app on that can collect the, the, the data that's, that, that's needed that multiple people can input into. I think your example actually gives us a lot of cause for hope. I mean, the fact that they actually have two phones in this house is actually pretty unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what they don't interestingly have is a landline in this house. Which, <laughs> it, it, and when you think about data, um, what that means is they don't have legacy systems. They don't have all these old systems that they have to integrate with and deal with. So they may be actually be poised to be in a good position to actually lead some of this data revolution because they don't have to worry about all the old junk that we have to worry about. So a little hope for there. <laughs> you know, one of the other things to think about too is, is that you know many, many of these phones that are, that are being distributed right in, in a lot of the African nations, and, and that's to, to just this point, it's really primary mechanism for communication. They're not necessarily all, you know, our iPhones or full-featured Android uh, smartphones. They tend to be feature phones, right? They can do things like, like SMS text messaging and what have you. So, so we've partnered with, you know, so, some uh, 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 some African nations as well to help make use of what they do have, right? And, and this is to Nancy's point. There's not necessarily every uh, phone for every person, but how do you then utilize the technology that, look, it doesn't really matter whether this is my phone or, or whether it's somebody else's phone, but what we can do is we can use the text messaging features uh, to combat things like counterfeit drugs, which is a huge problem. 
uh, in, in Africa. So, you know, partnering with some drug manufacturers uh, and, and the cell phone providers and the nations to allow a particular community to send a text message uh, with a particular code on a particular drug and the manufacturer saying, yes, that thing that you're holding in your hand is actually the right drug. It's not counterfeit. That doesn't matter whether it's my phone or my wife's phone or my kid's phone. It's one phone that we can all use. So it's understanding the kind of technology that they do have in their hands and that it's communal in, in many cases and finding the right use cases, right use cases to, take, to benefit uh, that, that particular community. It's a major challenge, right? I mean, that's, that's what I see, when, you know, being an infrastructure, infrastructure company and, and having been in infrastructure companies my entire career. That's one of the biggest challenges that we see out there. It's not just in Africa, right? We see this in all the great countries, right? You know, Brazil, India, Russia, China. You know, we have the same thing. Cell phone use is growing. Believe it or not, today, 90% of the use on them is basic voice, right? So how do we really enable those data capabilities? It, it's going to be that infrastructure change that you're going to see that's going to enable that data change. And from somebody who travels extensively, um, lived in Europe for a while, covering Europe, the Middle East, and Africa, I can tell you the infrastructure is just not there today to do a lot of that ask. That's our biggest struggle. We're going to do a quick speed round now and a few more questions. Yeah. So, uh, right here, <laughs> and then uh, we'll do uh, one more. Um, we're Hi, I'm Elizabeth Grossman I'm with Microsoft. Um, but I, I wanted to actually look a little bit ahead on some of the big data questions and pick up a couple of threads um, that I've uh, heard. One of the, the uh, comments had to do with making the uh, knowledge or the information that comes out of the data actionable. But another comment also talked about the velocity of the data. And you, you made a reference to um, making decisions and fixes on Black Friday, where, where real time matters. Um, and so I, I wanted to sort of ask a, a sort of a provocative question of what's the right balance between um, providing recommendations or insights from the data and actually linking that up to automated actions, right? Where you, you, you actually take the data inclusion and the system actually acts on it. And I think this might be a chance to bring in some of the, the perspectives from the vehicle industry, et cetera. Um, and and where, where are we going on those questions and what's the appropriate use of that in both business and individual settings? And before you respond, why don't we get to the second question, and then uh, we'll go down the line and then, uh, do a quick response to this. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Andy Cameron. I live and work here on the Hill. I'm a uh, <coughs> advisor to the intelligence world on next generation of warfare, next generation of decision making. I'm also an advisor to Congress, and I'm still very boring at cocktail parties. <laughs> uh, one, Quick observation and question to uh, Scott, number one, no offense. <laughs> when you were talking about the door uh, hangers, that number four of you know getting the neighbors to do something because your neighbors are doing that. When you send out a piece of paper um, in the bill, I'm waiting for that one utility company not to send me a piece of paper, but to send me an app. I want because, you know, uh, analytics are great, but I need my own analytics. So, um, you know, I want you to send me an app <coughs> that I can use on Zoom on my uh, uh, pad at home to figure out whether I'm making the right decisions for my own pro uh, program. I think uh, big data is only big when I don't have any app access to it. When it's when my analytics talk to your analytics, then it's not big data, it's just data. The next generation of decision making, uh, in fact, I was at an intelligence briefing uh, just recently, um, and they said, asked me what I saw as, you know, next thing in generation because of data saturation. I told them that I wanted to see not standards and data, but I wanted to see every major in every uh, armed service with an iPad and Zoom because I want each one of them to build their own search engine to, uh, to make so they can make better decisions because they're the ones that face the risk, they're the ones that know about that. 
but big analytics are great, but I need analytics on, um, on my end. Not really a question, but what do you see the future of the end user analytics being? All right, so we've got two great questions to react to. Uh, we have to keep it short, so we'll just work down uh, from Scott, uh, down to William, and uh, 20 seconds. Okay, uh, so, so really quickly, let's take this one. Because so what you're really talking about is personal analytics, right? It's all about me, right? There's lots of data that's out there, but it's really all about me. So one of, if I can't use right. it on this, then it doesn't exist. Right, exactly. So so, so really quickly, um, you know, we, we see a lot of this in the area of what we call context-aware computing, right? The idea is who's, who's holding that device? You know, what, what device do you have? What is it that you're actually trying to do? Now go get all the information in the ether about me and about this particular situation that I'm doing. Pull all that together and make it very tactical to my need right now. So we're working on solutions that are very similar. So it's really sort of a, a personal analytics or context-aware computing to the, to the given person and context that you're in. Yeah, almost. Okay. Sorry, where, where were we talking about? I mean, your two questions are actually the same The same question. It's how do we push the decision-making down to the right person and give them what they need to know, and then how do we automatically make the decision if they don't even need to, we don't need to bother them right now? And I would uh, have you guys look at the Nest thermostat. I don't know if you've seen this thing. And it all ties into machine learning and predictive analytics, right? It's this thermostat. You just, like, you know, whenever you're cold, you turn it up. Whenever you're hot, you turn it down. And after you do that a couple times, it just learns and just does it for you. And a lot of decisions can be automated in that manner, and a lot of them can't be. And we've been working with things like e-commerce and ad placement. Like, you, you need to first decide where to place ads, but after a while, you need to automatically figure out which ones work and which don't. So that's really what you talked about, is push those information at the right person at the right time, only when necessary, otherwise make the decision for them. Um, and that's really where this is all, all going. Thanks, Justin. Yeah, and, and I'll be honest with you, I'm a big believer in making sure that everybody has access, right? So. When I talk about standards, the thing that's important to me from a standards perspective, right, when I look at like, you know, why, why I think metadata is a big piece to this, not just about when everybody have their own Google engine at their, at their fingertips, right, but I want them to be able to go define, you know, what it is I want, where, I, where do I plan on getting it from, how do I plan on getting it, to ask those questions and to be able to query it. You know, we can do that today on Amazon, right? Anybody that's been on Amazon knows you know, if I bought X medication, it's going to give me recommendations, right? Very similar scenario that you're talking about. How do we make that global, right? And that's where I think the standards are going to be a big player in how we do that. It's, you know, once we create the standards, I mean, we have it today, right? We want to look up a telephone number. We all know how to do that, right? It's something we've all done inherently. We know we can use the phone book. We know we can use the internet. How do I make it that way for all information consistently? And give it to not just that frontline guy, <clears throat> me, my personal opinion is I want that shooter in a foxhole to be able to look at his iPhone or his Android device and say, what's coming at me, right? Ask a simple question, and he's going to get, you know, video streams, imagery. He's going to get real-time, you know, human intelligence that's all going to push down to him and say, based on what we know, this is what's in front of you. So if you're going to shoot, make sure you shoot in this direction, right? <laughs> that's really what we're talking about. And for an end consumer to have that capability, that's one of the things that's going to drive this economy. It's going to drive our warfighters to better things. It's going to drive you know us to build better automobiles, better cities. I mean, it, it's just my opinion. It's the holy grail. It really is. Thanks. I think your question is a complex one, and I think in many ways it's use case specific in terms of the answer. On the one hand, here's the conundrum: we as humans uh, are actually fairly limited in our ability to recognize patterns. A computer can do a much much better job. On the other hand, computers will only be looking at, in a sense, what we've told them to look at. So there's often a lot of context that they may not know. So when you make something automatic, you better be careful that you've really programmed in all of the contextual things that need to need, need to be considered. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, we have worked with Toronto Sick Kids Hospital to look at streams of data coming out of, of uh, neonates, neonates in, in premature babies in, in a neonatal unit. And we can identify 24 hours earlier uh, than a human can that they're coming down with an infection. Would I want a machine to automatically inject that baby with antibiotics? I don't think so. Because, you know, have we considered, is there a family history of allergy to this specific thing? You know? So it, it, we have to weigh that. On the other hand, there are lots of situations where we can automate things. Uh, take the human out of the equation and, and achieve incredible efficiencies and better outcomes. Uh, sure. So um, first I want to show you, 
pro power it started with paper it's not stopping there absolutely these things have to go digital to really empower the end user and it's not just about making it accessible but the, the more you can make it a digital link the more they can feed information back in as the end user so that what you deliver to them is ultimately even more effective and even more helpful longer term uh, I, and, and to the other person asking a question i think you're right there is a bit of a tension between making something actionable and and sort of automatic although i think we have to be careful about not thinking about as something that's mutually exclusive. Um, so take the example in the energy space of what's called a um, you know, peak event, very hot day in the summer where the energy company is struggling to, to meet demand. They don't want the, the lights to go out. They don't want to fire up if they can avoid it, a costly idle plant and so forth. So what are some things you can do to make that, to make that work? Well, one thing you can do is if you've got a, you know, a digital piece or a, you know, a digital point is send an end user some sort of message saying, hey, do your laundry not at noon today but do it at nine at night when nobody else is running things, or the next day, and maybe there's some way you can be compensated for that. But the other flip side is there's an automatic element, which is, and we've already started to see some of this, you know, for instance, in big companies, they might have agreed with the utility that they're willing to, to cycle their AC, so it goes on and off at times during these really hot events, so that, you know, you're not noticing it necessarily in the building, but in terms of good for the overall sort of utility footprint, they will avoid, again, firing up those really, um, you know, those, uh, those plants that are less attractive. So yes, you know, digital is key, everybody's going there. Um, but let's be careful about balancing those. Thanks, Tim. Well, you got the first word in. Uh, maybe the last. Uh, uh, this, this will sort of target the, the question for, for Microsoft uh, the context. And I think in terms of you asked, you know, what is the time that you need? I, I think it's multi multifaceted. Uh, I don't think there's a clear answer. Um, if, if you're trying to make a decision on what route to take or, or you want that in, in real time. I want to know if there's an accident and the road is blocked. I want to know if there's congestion. Should I route another way? Should I should I stop at the park and ride and take it? And you need that information quickly. Because bad information can have negative consequences too. If you're told that there's traffic in this route and you're sending everyone another way and there is no traffic, that's not really helping anything. You're not receiving the time, energy, and economic benefits that, that you, you'd hope to. And then there's there's longer term, there's the aggregation of data that, that might affect the city. DC United is playing, uh, parking traffic is going to be different. Th those are acute instances. And then there's the accumulation over years, right? Where do I need to reinvest in, in road uh, widening? Where do I need to reinvest in signal timing? Where do I want to think about uh, uh, investing in parking or, or um, time of day pricing? That, that data, you don't need that right away. You need to collect that and analyze that over the course of a year or several years. So. It runs the entire spectrum based on what you're trying to do and who you're trying to inform on that decision making. But there's a lot of need across uh, the entire spectrum, I think. Great. Thank you. And please join me in thanking our panelists.